So here's an unconventional but surprisingly easy way of doing an ersatz rotisserie chicken at home. It gets you a chicken with a really nice crispy skin, but more significantly, it gets you these potatoes that you cook underneath the hanging chicken. They're basically fried in chicken fat. I'll start with a four to five pound chicken, any bigger than that, and the potatoes might be burned by the time the chicken is cooked. And hey, let's do another one, because this is a very efficient method for doing multiple chickens at once if you're feeding a crowd. First, a ton of salt goes on the tops. It should feel like too much because a chicken is a big thing with a lot of mass relative to its surface area. Then I'll do garlic powder and paprika. Those are the classic grocery store rotisserie chicken spices in the US at least. Also some black pepper. And I'll smush that all around and then flip them over and do the exact same thing to the other side. If a lot of seasoning falls onto the pan underneath, that's just fine because that's where the potatoes are going eventually. I'll stick half a lemon inside each one and you could absolutely roast these right now. But I'm gonna gonna stick them uncovered into the fridge for a day or two to dry cure. The bottoms are up on a rack, so there will be air circulation all around, and the skin will dry out, which will make it nice and crispy. Here's how it will look after a day. Unlike traditional seasoning, curing like this actually does season the interior of the meat. The salt draws moisture to the surface, it dissolves into that moisture, which in turn is slowly reabsorbed into the meat. You just season it, throw it in the fridge uncovered, and forget about it for a day. You'll be amazed how much the meat improves. It's rather like saving money. If you watch it constantly, it looks like absolutely nothing is happening, but if you sock it away and forget about it for a while, things really start to accrue. And that's exactly why you should use Digit, the sponsor of this video. It's an app that helps you save money, available on iOS, Android, and the web. Use my link below to try Digit for yourself with a 30-day free trial. You get the app, then you connect it to your bank account. It takes two seconds. Digit's artificial intelligence just looks at your account history and analyzes your income and your spending habits, so so you don't need to adjust your lifestyle. You just tell Digit what you want to save for. I never used to have any savings for emergencies, but I have kids now and I can't screw around. I really should have had an emergency fund all along. But the big thing that I'm saving for right now is a bigger house. Because my children are rapidly expanding and I have an imaginary job on the internet, so I reckon that any mortgage company is going to want a big down payment from me. But you can of course use Digit for perhaps less ambitious things like, say, paying down your credit card debt. Digit can actually send the money straight to the credit card company for you. Again, you just set a goal and Digit does the math and starts saving your money for you. You just don't have to be good at this. And don't worry, there's overdraft protection. Digit can transfer money from your savings to your checking if you ever get too low, and you can pause your saving at any time. The funds in your Digit account are held at FDIC-insured banks and insured up to a balance of a quarter million dollars, and you unlock a savings bonus every 90 days. Use my link below to try Digit for yourself with a 30-day free trial. And thanks to Digit for sponsoring this video. Now here's the chickens 24 hours later. The skin is looking a little leathery, and that is good. Though again, that dry curing phase is totally optional. Time to tie these things up. You need maybe three feet or a meter of butcher's twine for each chicken. Step one is to nestle the middle of the string underneath the chicken along its spine. Then send one end of that string up along the length of the breast, and I'm seating it right in that natural depression over the keel bone. Right over the bird's rear end there, I'm gonna wrap the two ends of string around each other, and then I'm gonna tie the two legs together. It's more secure if you can get one knee joint laid on top of the other like that. All right, I'll show you that again. I'm neither a butcher nor a boy scout. I'm terrible with knots, so if I can do this, you can too. Middle of the string is underneath the bird along its backbone, and then, whoops, I'm in your way. All right, then you got to just wind the two ends around each other once or twice, just like that. Then use the excess to tie the legs together, ideally with one knee kind of locked over the other. I'm using a butcher's knot to tie them off, but anything secure is fine. Okay, now to hang the chickens from your oven racks, you're gonna need some large metal S-hooks. I'm sure you could buy something from a hardware store, but I bent these out of a wire coat hanger. Works just fine. You just hook that through the chicken's tied legs, and there you go, hanging chicken. I tried to do this once by simply tying the legs together. I did not send that supporting string all the way down around the breast, and when the chicken was almost done, the dark meat went soft and the bird literally fell out of its own hip joints. So yeah, you need the string to wrap all the way down around the chicken at least once. You also need to make sure that you hook the chicken between its legs and not on this other string that's suspended over the cavity. That is not strong enough. It will break in the oven and your chicken will fall. The legs are stronger. All right, let's prep the oven. If you have three racks, take one of them out and just stash it somewhere. Then put one rack all the way in the top position and one all the way in the bottom position. Heat-wise, I use my convection roast setting at 425 Fahrenheit, that's like 220C, but really every oven is different and I think you're gonna have to experiment a bit. Certainly, if ever there was a time to use convection, now is it. 
All right, now potatoes. I've got three pounds or a kilo and a half of floury baking potatoes, russets. And I think russet skins are gross unless they get exclusively dry heat, so I will peel these. I think any potato would be fine for this as long as they're big enough that you can cut big chunks out of them. But mealy potatoes like these seem to be better at absorbing all the chicken goodness. I've got some dirt on those, so I'll wash them off. And now we're going to cut them into really thick slices, like an inch and a half or four centimeters. They're going to shrink a ton while cooking, and if you have any pieces that are too small, like that one, you might as well just throw them away because they're just going to burn. Now I'll move those chickens off the rack. Now, this is one of those situations where it really helps to have a probe thermometer that's on an oven-safe cable. That way you can plunge it into the thickest part of the breast right now, and not when this chicken is hanging perilously in a hot oven. Be careful not to hit bone. Bones get hotter than meat. And I will oil them up a tiny bit. That really gets you a much browner skin. Let's get rid of that dirty rack, because underneath it we have a pre-seasoned sheet pan on which to put our potatoes. Everything about this method is so synergistic, which I think is really valuable for home cooking. You want to make sure the potatoes are evenly spaced out and all lying flat in one layer. Pan goes onto the low rack, and then we take the chicken and just hook it onto one of the bars in the upper rack. You can see why you need a big S-hook for this. If it was little, you'd be more likely to touch those hot racks and burn yourself doing this. I think the legs getting pulled taut like that helps the dark meat to get more heat and to cook faster, which is always the challenge in roasting chickens. The white meat is always done before the dark meat. Last thing is to just pour a thin layer of liquid into the pan with the potatoes. I've got an open container of stock to use, but you could get away with water. If you don't have some liquid in there to start with, the potatoes would probably cook faster than the chickens, and you definitely get a ton of smoke in your kitchen from the drippings hitting the bare pan surface. All right, close her up, and then you'll want to check on these every 15 minutes or so and shift the rack around so that all of the potatoes get some direct drippage from the chickens. I just love this method because you'd have to put a drip pan under the chickens anyway, so it might as well have some potatoes on it. Halfway through cooking, half of this pan is dry because the stock is evaporating, which is good, but my oven is not level, which is bad, so I've rotated the pan to let the remaining stock flow down to the other side for a little while. And after about an hour of roasting, the internal temperature is like 162 Fahrenheit, or 72 C. By the time these rest, that'll be a perfect 165. Be sure to use an oven mitt when you unhook these. Those hooks are hot. I'll also take the pan of potatoes out now. You could certainly eat those right away, but since the oven is already hot and we need to rest the chickens for a while anyway, I like to use a stout metal spatula to scrape these up off the pan and then flip them so that we can crisp the other side. Don't worry if they get kind of beat up in this process. Those rough up surfaces go beautifully crisp. I'm going to sneak that right onto the upper rack so we get some nice direct heat radiating onto those surfaces. All right, you note that I'm resting these chickens on a clean rack. That's to keep the bottom skin nice and dry and crispy. Maybe 10 minutes later, I'm worried some of these are going to start to burn, so out the tray comes, and I'll let those rest alongside the chickens. Let them firm up a bit before we scrape them off again. All right, let's chop up a chicken. Note how crispy the skin on the underside of the leg and thigh is. That's the one thing you don't get when you roast a chicken down in a pan, which is my normal method. I usually just like to tear off the whole leg quarter, then lop off the entire breast, cut the leg off from the thigh, and then slice up the breast. A little mixture of light and dark meat on the plate, then some of those potatoes. It's basically a very crude fondant potato we've made there. And a nice little side salad that I made while the birds were roasting. An acidic dressing really cuts the chicken fat in the potatoes, which, by the way, may or may not need some finishing salt at the end. It's up to you. They did get some salt from the chicken and the stock. And yeah, that tastes like a chicken nugget. Nice crispy skin on that chicken leg, very tasty. Again, dry brining is not necessary, but because we can't make gravy or pan sauce when we do this, it helps to have the meat somewhat flavored on the inside. I know it seems like an elaborate method, but honestly, this is a very simple, very efficient home-cooked meal, and those chicken-flavored potatoes are just bonkers, well worth a few feet of string. Don't forget to try saving money with Digit, link is in the description, and save your chickens by hooking them between their legs. If you hook them just through the string, it's gonna break, not that I would know that from experience.